I think all of us have seen a yo-yo. We may have called some people yo-yos at times, but I mean a real yo-yo. We may have even used a yo-yo. And the thing that you think of when you think of a yo-yo is going up and down and up and down. People are quite adept at making them do other things, but that's primarily it. That's all right as a toy of amusement, maybe even showing some skill in being able to make it do things that doesn't seem quite right. But when it comes to our lives, the Lord never intended us as God's children, Christians, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, to be on some kind of spiritual yo-yo, up one second and down the next. Paul told the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, that we have hope in that great chapter on the resurrection. I again wish that we would remove the idea of wish from this word hope as it's employed by Paul here. The Spirit guided him. For it means an expectation of what a faithful child of God has a right to expect. But it means more than that. It's coupled with a great desire to receive what we have a right to expect. Romans 8, 24 says we're saved by that hope. I can, by the eye of faith, look beyond life's burdens, life's toils, even beyond death. And I can see the promised land. I can see our long home, to use the prophet's terminology. I can see eternity through the eye of faith. Thus, when you look to Hebrews 6 and 11, you see that the rest of the story is told because this word hope implies an assurance, an assurance. And the scripture reads in Hebrews 6 and 11, full assurance of faith, or rather of hope, unto the end. Now, notice I substituted faith there for a moment for hope. But where one does not go, the other cannot be. We must have a proper faith in God, a saving faith, an obedient faith. It must be exercised daily. It cannot be exercised if we do not know God's terms of pardon and how he would have us live in the church, his family, the spiritual body of Christ. Therein are those who have a right to earnestly desire and expect heaven. They can look beyond this world. So let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Faith is that trust and confidence. In a world that assaults the Christian with enticing temptations, soliciting us on every hand to violate God's will, and because most follow that route, there is tremendous turmoil in the world. And the very thing the world needs, it rejects. And it seeks to find comfort, strength, and peace in places it cannot do so and in ways that cannot bring the assurance that every honest-hearted person would love to have. Well, God through Christ and his gospel system has given us as members of the church assurance. Thus, this lesson is addressed in two ways. First of all, to the member of the church, to the Christian, the one who is of Christ to encourage, to strengthen, to cause us to persevere, to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as we know, there's an assurance. For as much as we know, 
our labor is not in vain, pointless or worthless. Where? In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's also designed to the person who's not a Christian to really say to you, outside of Christ, you don't have this. Outside of Christ, there's nothing but turmoil. There is nothing but the fear of falling into the hands of a living God. And His justice will exact from you what a person dying guilty of sin deserves. Eternally punished. No end to it. We're living in the time of being able to come back to God through His mercy, through His grace, by His gospel, in full belief and obedience to it. And our need is clearly stated in Hebrews 6.19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now that's written to people who really need to be encouraged, need to be strengthened, for fear of persecution, they were actually thinking about leaving the Christian system. And yet, outside the Christian system, New Testament teaching, outside the boundaries of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, there is none of that. People may appear to be peaceful, but in reality they're not. So amid the storms of life, oh yes, and they will come. They do come, and it's fruitless and ridiculous and absurd to say they will not come. That happened to you, won't happen to me. That's just not the way it works. Something has to anchor us here, and the faithful child of the living God, the church member who's faithful to the Lord, the Christian, has that anchor. Nobody else does. Everybody else is under the power of Satan. They're in rebellion to God. They're in a state of being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slide of men, whereby they in cunning craft and his lie and wait to deceive us. They trust in themselves or other men. There's no anchor to hold us against the swift currents of evil. Well, some will question, how can you be sure? How can you be sure? Which really translates into, what is your assurance? Well, there's some very good reasons for our full assurance of faith. Thus, this lesson is designed to remind ourselves, children of God, to remind ourselves, to encourage one another by that being, uh, by our being reminded of what we have in Christ. First of all, God loves us. Now you say, well, I'm, why, why is that a big deal? I've known that or would never have become a Christian. Well, it's very easy for people to be going through such trials and tribulations that they reach a stage of, what's the use? Sometimes it comes from the standpoint of saying, well, I try hard, I try hard, and it, it, it just doesn't come. Well, if you trust in yourself to be able to live without thinking there's ever any room for improvement or need of the mercy and grace of God, the cleansing blood of Christ, then I understand that yo-yo mentality. I know Christians should have that up and down mentality. When God made man in his own image, you'll remember as we studied on Wednesday night that a law, pure positive law was given in Genesis 2, 17, right only because God said so. You can't partake of that tree of the knowledge, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, for the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's a penalty for violation of God's law, and it was death. Man sinned. Well, that penalty, that penalty has not changed. 
Paul wrote in Romans 6, or, uh, yes, 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Well, I might be able to stomach that a little bit, but then I read earlier back in Romans 3.23, all, no one's left out that's accountable to God, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Thus, when Eve sinned, Adam sinned, God promised a Savior, vague though it was as they saw it in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But then for us who have all of the revelation of God in the Bible, the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, that promise of Genesis 3, 15 is repeated again and again with fuller expression and meaning and Paul deals with that in the Galatian epistle in chapter 3, 16 through 29 when he shows down through Abraham and so forth that finally the seed of woman of Genesis 3, 15 would bring forth the Son of God, John 1, 1 and 2 and verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John says, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Christ is the promise. It comes down to this. When God promised in Genesis 3.15 he would do what he would do and then elaborated on it, made it more clear down through the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the unfolding of what we have in the time of the Old Testament, then he kept his promise. Christ is that promise. So we look at sinful man, we begin where we ought to begin, we look at ourselves, and really we see nothing which can commend us to God. You say, yeah, but I'm not a murderer, a liar, a cheat, and all that. But you've got to realize any transgression of God's will separates you from God. Remember, just simply partaking of that fruit God said don't eat of separated Adam and Eve from God allowed sin entrance into the world, thus all have sinned. So we need to understand that we can never claim once we've sinned that, well, I'm, it's no the big sin, a little sin. I, I, I'm not guilty of any big sin. There's no such thing. Now, there may be big and little sins that stand for the consequences of them among men. <laughs> I've used this always. It's a sin to murder me. It's a sin to lie about me. But I've got to choose one over the other. I will choose that you lie about me. So the consequences of sin sometimes go further, different sins. But it's a fact we cannot save ourselves from our sins. Jeremiah 10, 23 and the various others. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, outside of Christ, we're totally completely and forever doomed. So when I speak of in full assurance of faith, something's happened between that person guilty of sin and destined to a devil's hell by pure justice and in the person who's a faithful member of the church that Jesus built. There's one thing that stands between us in eternal damnation and devil's hell. And that marvel stated in one of the most quoted verses in the world from the Bible. And yet I don't know that many who quote it understand really what it says. And that's John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But that doesn't mean that you won't. But the first step is having faith. When we're talking about the full assurance of faith that faithful Christians possess, the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. That uh, faith must be a living, active, obedient faith. 
such as when Abraham in Genesis 22 was commanded to take thy son, the son whom thou lovest, the son that he knew had to live to be able for God, for God to be able to perform the promises that he had promised him back in Genesis 12, 1, 2, and 3, and 4. That through thy seed, singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and I will make of thee a great nation. Now you tell me to go sacrifice that son? But Abraham had the full assurance of faith. Abraham knew God would reconcile all these things. Who was he but a mere human to figure out those things? God promised him these things, and he's told me to do this. He'll work it out. And from the book of Hebrews, we learned that he thought that once he offered him on the altar, he would, of the ashes, raise up Isaac again. Well, that wasn't the way he chose, but you can see the thing of a man who trusted God to perform his promises. He knew God would do it. And if Abraham could think and realize that God could do it that way, then Abraham could know he could do it in ways I cannot even think of. But he didn't even have to actually kill his son. In his heart he had done so, but God stayed his hand. So he stands as the person exemplary for all of us in the church as the kind of faith that we must have if we're to have the full assurance of faith, the trust, the confidence of belief in God and the things of God. Now, how could God love rebellious sinners? When you think about it, how could he love rebellious sinners is really beyond our comprehension. But aren't you glad that the word of the living God says... The God who keeps his promises, Genesis 3, 15 and on. He does, even as he did. He loves us. So that means those of us who have been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, based upon our belief in Christ, formed by the truth of the gospel, God's power to save, that means that no matter how low things get for us and what we have to deal with in this world, God still loves us. God still loves us. In 1 John 4, verses 9 through 10, the great apostle of love, John, wrote to Christians. Herein was the love of God manifested in us that God hath sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might have life through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that's said to Christians. That's not said to a person outside of Christ. Specifically that to get that person to understand God loves them and the need to obey the gospel, though it serves that purpose. This is said to Christians after the church had been on this earth a good while in the first century. They were persecuted for righteousness' sake. And simply because the world's against you and false brethren are against you and economically you're in a mess, does that rule out God, God still loves you. God's still on your side. God's still behind what's going on. I want to pause to interject this, though it's worthy really of a sermon all its own. I want to pick Joseph. We could pick somebody else, but we'll pick Joseph of the Old Testament. Joseph was envied by his brethren. He, he really had a father who spoiled him. So he was raised sort of with everything centered around him. Brothers did not like it. That's putting it mildly. Anyway, to make a long story short, they would have killed him. But a brother prevailed upon them and they put him in a pit and sold him into slavery. Could you do that to one of your family members? 
They got rid of him that way. But they were deceitful. They took his coat of many colors and put goat's blood on it, made it look like it had been attacked by a wild animal, and took it to Jacob and did that to their father. Calloused hearted. They didn't care what misery it put their father through, for he thought he was dead. So Joseph sold into captivity. Now, look at all that Joseph went through. The trouble in the house of Potiphar with his wife. Then in prison, he interprets dreams, and the people that benefits from them forgets, the, forgets him. And on we go. Years pass before he comes to the point that allows him to be what we know Joseph was in preparing everything, which God all had in mind, was to bring the Messianic family down into Egypt to grow into the Messianic nation. So all of this trouble, had God stopped loving Joseph? Or was it a part of the scheme of things on this earth for what this earth was created for to pull us together? Did Joseph lose his full assurance of faith? Did he lose his hope? He even tells his brothers when he reveals himself to them, you meant all of this for evil. But you see, God worked it for good. Sometimes to get to the place that we pray about, that we yearn for, that we strive for, we have to go through some things like Joseph did. I won't even mention what happened for Daniel and the three Hebrew children. They went through the same thing, but God meant it. I will mention this about Daniel and the three Hebrew children. When they were delivered into the Babylonian captivity, Daniel said, God gave the king into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. God allowed that to happen. Now, he used it to punish them because they wouldn't listen to the prophets and wouldn't pay attention to the law of Moses. But the thing of it is, God was in all of that. Yet, Daniel and three Hebrew children didn't seem to be bad people. In fact, they're exceedingly good people and become even better in the examples for us. Because of full assurance of faith, look at their lives. And so it is, John writes the same in 1 John 4, 9 through 10 that we read. Because God loves us, we have great assurance. The devil, I think, tries to get us to think, if I stumble, God's going to kick me right off the cliff into the bottomless pit. Notice what is said by Paul, Romans 8, 31 and 32. If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, let me ask you something. Is he for his son's church, his family? That church purchased by the blood of Christ, Christ suffered and gave his life for it. Is he for it? Yes. That means he's for each member of it. Because uh, we have fled for refuge, as it were under the mighty and comforting wings of our Savior. If God be for us, who can be against us? And this is the reasoning that's done here by Paul. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That said the Christians. In a time when they were being severely persecuted, and would be even more so as the years went by. What's he saying? God loves you. When Paul and Barnabas were, actually Silas at this time, is in Philippian jail, where the real bad guys were, they'd been beaten, their feet were fast in the stocks, they were in physical misery. They sang praises to God. I wonder how they could do that, full assurance of faith. Do you think it was going through their minds? God still loves me. It's all part and parcel to readying myself for heaven. If God 
loved us enough to allow Christ to die for us, he surely will not turn his back on us now. While God never condones sin, he still loves the sinner. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 and verse 8. Again, the person outside of Christ needs to know that, but that's written to Christians. Another reason is that we have full assurance of faith, that it serves as an anchor of the soul, is that we've been born again. I hear this terminology exercised by the denominational people, born again Christian. There is no such thing. You're born again to become a Christian. John 3, 3 and 5. You're born by water and the Spirit in the kingdom of heaven. You're a Christian because you were born again. The process of becoming a Christian is to be born again of water and the Spirit, to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. A ruler of the Jews, you'll remember, who trusted in his own physical birth because that's all he understood. And this tells us a lot of what the Jews thought. That is, he was a descendant of Abraham through Jacob. Thus he thought that was sufficient. He came to Jesus and the first thing Jesus said to this man who trusted in his physical birth, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know the force of the exceptional clause? It means this. If and only if you're born again will you see the kingdom of God. And it was Nicodemus, and that astonished and surprised him. All he could think of was a physical birth. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time to his mother's womb, be born? Well, Jesus gets to the point that he needed to understand. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except if and only if a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 1 and 5, 1 through 5. Paul declares that Christians have been begotten by the gospel, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. And that's echoed by the inspired James in James 1 and verse 18. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Both those letters written to Christians. So when one receives in an honest heart, Luke 8, 15, the word of truth and is enlightened thereby, it's the Spirit of God who revealed that truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And that person is the free moral agent, understands it and believes it. He then, in obedience to the demands of the gospel, is begotten of God, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25. And again, John writes it in verse John 5. But notice... Jesus did say, and it's obligatory, it cannot be bypassed, sidestepped. One must be born of water and the Spirit. The Lord made promise in, of course, giving the great commission of the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. So the Spirit leading people by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, put their trust in Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And in belief they were baptized in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38 and on through the book of Acts. I'll just let it go with that way because it's chocked full of references of people, conversions of people who were obedient to the gospel. Now, when they did all those things, that is, obey the gospel, they were born again. Thus, they had a new life, new creatures in Christ. And that's clearly set forth in a number of passages. Think of these. Being now justified by his blood, come down a little bit later, reconciled to God by the death of his son, 
Then as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Romans 5, 9 through 10, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Again, that's not said to people who didn't believe in Christ. That's said to those who've heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel, been born again, baptized for Christ. So when we, through scriptural, proper faith, trust, confidence, are baptized into the death of Christ, then his blood cleanses us from sin. And thus we're raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ. That's because we've been born of water and the Spirit. This is precisely what is stated in Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Thus, in a similar vein, the inspired apostle Peter wrote these words, In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, the like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because we've been born again into the family of God, new creatures, citizens in Christ, converted to Christ, Old sins gone, covered by the blood of Christ, serving God faithfully. The old man's crucified with him, Romans 6 and verse 6. But what about the new man? Listen, the new man is renewed under the image of him that created him, Colossians 3.10. Full assurance of faith. Full confidence in God that the promise is kept, that your sins are remitted, You're reconciled to God. You're justified in His sight. You stand before Him guiltless. So what may come upon you in this life should not separate you from God and cannot separate you from God. Only I, through rejection of Christ, can separate myself from God. And the last point, we have full assurance of faith because we're not under condemnation. Surely you've seen that already from what we've said Can a Christian live so that he's always in a right relationship with God? No, I want you to answer that question of yourself. Can a Christian live so that he's always in a right relationship with God? If you can't answer yes to that, you need to go back to the very first principles and start over again on the things we've been talking about. A lot of folks may say that's impossible because it implies that a person would never sin. But that answer is just as wrong as God's assurance to us is right. Listen to Romans 8 verse 1. And believe it. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You believe that? That's given so that we can be in full assurance of faith. If we have been born again. Scripture says we've been called out of darkness, the realm where sin dominates and devil rules. And we've been called into marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, 9. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, I've quoted it once, we have fellowship one with another. And what happens? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7 again. Do we trust the promises that God would send his son? Do we trust that Jesus lived a life tempted in every point like as we are to sin yet without sin? That he would go to the cross and die because he was sinless on our behalf to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. When we were baptized into his death, do we have full confidence that his blood was a pride and God in his mind says, there, I will remember those sins against you no more. That the Lord added us to his church, Acts 2, 47, and that therein the blood cleanses. So when we're born again, the blood cleanses us or we wouldn't be in the church. And as we live in that 
newness of life. The blood continues to cleanse us. First John 1 7. Stumble from time to time? Of course, we're human beings. This is a system of grace through an obedient faith. It's not a system of pure law. Paul said if salvation could come by the law, it would come by the law of Moses. But it couldn't. You see, the blood covers. Because the faithful child of God, the new creature in Christ, because of full assurance of faith, is constantly aware of the fact they need the Lord. They need His mercy. They need His continual forgiveness. That doesn't mean that you know you're sinning and you won't change. That's not a new creature. The person who's a new creature in Christ is not trying to sin. No, that person's trying to do right the opposite. I won't say which one, but Brett led a song a while ago, and you see if you can find it, that echoes that very sentiment. It says if we get to heaven, we won't sin anymore, and therefore we won't sorrow God. Well, what did you mean when you sang that? Except that you have full assurance of faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. And we walk by faith and not by sight. As we close the lesson, I hope that you will fortify yourself with these truths of God's good word to get overlooked many times. That in full assurance of faith, your hope and expectation of glory with an earnest desire to receive heaven will grow in you until someday you'll be able to hear, well done, thou, now listen, thou good and faithful servant. The one that's had the blood of Christ continually applied from baptism all the way through because you were steadfast, unmovable, always abounding glory to the Lord. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. He kept his promise in Genesis 3.15 and many more. He will keep that promise too. And thus the full assurance of faith for every one of us who are faithful members of the Lord's church. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied what to do to become that. Now, why won't you obey the gospel? What's stopping you from obeying the gospel? Does the truth mean nothing to you? Do you not know that outside of Christ, surely you have no hope? So we urge you to obey the gospel. As a child of God, what is your faith? Is it a vibrant, living, obedient faith? If so, you have full assurance of faith. But if you need to rectify any problems, repent of them, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and sing.